Welcome to the Daily Word this morning. I'm John, I'm one of the pastors of Redeemer Bible Church, and we're gonna be in John chapter three today. I'm sorry, John chapter five today. So grab your Bibles and open to John chapter five. That is John chapter five. And if you haven't read John chapter five yet, please press pause now and go read it. Okay, hopefully you've done it, now you're back. John chapter five. And so what, what I want you to think through when we come to John chapter five, what I want you to notice is that up until this point in the book of John, there really hasn't been much conflict. But in John chapter five, things go from zero to 100. We go from no Jewish leaders really doing anything. John chapter five, by the first part of the chapter, they wanna kill him. That They go from zero to 100, they want him dead. This is where the hostility in the book of John leads, which is going to eventually take us to the cross. Here, John chapter five, we're gonna see miracle number three. The miracle is gonna come before the explanation, so the healing is going to come, and then there's going to be all the witnesses. The witnesses are the proof. I'll talk about that more, that Jesus is who he says he is. And so the first section here we'll call the witness of a miracle, and that's chapter one, verses one to 30. So the, this, this healing takes place at the pool of Bethesda. And I just want you to know that just like yesterday in the, the, um, the well of Jacob's well in Sychar, that you can go to Google, you can type in pools of Bethesda, and you can see these actual pools. I've seen them with my own eyes. You can, you can see this in the city of Jerusalem where this took place. Well, this man was sick. He was, he was probably crippled. And, and what I want you to notice from this miracle is that Jesus just speaks, and this man is immediately well. You see divine power on display. Jesus is the Son of God because he does something only God can do. You see also divine compassion. You see, you see God in, in the person of Jesus uh, meeting somebody, helping somebody who is in need. And think about the miracle itself. Not just does it pronounce what Jesus is and who Jesus is, but it also shows you the nature of, of true miracles in, in contrast to charlatans, false ones, hucksters, fake false teachers. Notice there's no rehab. Notice the healing wasn't partial. Notice this says nothing about the man's faith in Jesus. This was instantaneous, instantaneous complete, the man is fully restored in an instant. That's true divine healing. And, and I don't want you to miss these words. John chapter uh, five, halfway verse, through verse nine. Now it was the Sabbath on that day. John is setting us up. He's setting us up for the first conflict. This is where conflict begins because it's gonna take us to the cross. Jesus reveals his identity uh, through this miracle. Look at verse 17. And he answered, my father is working until now, and I myself is working. Translation, hey, the, the father is working, and so I did this miracle because I, I saw the father doing it. Notice verse 10. So the Jews were saying to the man who was cured, it is the Sabbath, and it's not permissible for you to carry your pallet. You're not supposed to be doing this kind of work carrying that pallet. Totally missing the fact that he hadn't carried anything for 38 years, but hey, forget about that. Jesus is saying, the Father is working on the Sabbath, so I'm going to as well. And his, we miss what Jesus is actually saying, but thankfully, the Jewish leaders come along and, and tell us, here's what Jesus meant by that, verse 18. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Why? Because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. This is the text that tells you what it means for Jesus to be the Son of God. Son of God does not mean offspring, like uh, Jesus is the, is the um, production of some kind of sexual relationship with God the Father and somebody else. That's not what Son of God means. Son of God means Jesus is what the Father is. Just like you are what your parents are, you got your humanness from your parents. Jesus being called the Son of God or calling God his own Father, what he is saying is, I am the same thing, I'm the same stuff, I am deity just like the Father, and that's why they want him dead. Notice what more it says about Jesus, verse 19. He says, uh, Therefore, Jesus answered, saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it's something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. So translation, the Father was healing that man, so I simply was doing what God wanted me to do, what I saw the Father already doing. 
Verse 22, for not even the father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the son. The son is the judge of the world so that all will honor the son even as they honor the father. He who does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. So you think you're honoring God, but there is no honoring God unless you honor Jesus as the Son of God. Look at verse 27. Again, the whole section here. Here's the miracle, and then there's the explanation. Verse 30. I'm sorry, verse 27. And he gave him authority to execute judgment because he's the Son of Man. Going back to uh, Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, where this human, the Son of Man, goes into the very presence of God and isn't obliterated. Why? Because the Son of Man is also the Messiah. He's also the Lord, our righteousness. He also is the Son of God. And then verse 30, as we round out what is being said about Jesus in this passage, I can do nothing on my own initiative. I did not heal that man simply because I wanted to. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And before I move on to the next section, let me just say, this is a critical verse for Christians, especially if you are a pastor watching this. I do not seek my own will. I seek the will of him who sent me. You have been sent into your world. You, if you're a Christian, you've been sent into your world with a ministry. The question is, do you use your ministry to accomplish your will? Or do you exist to accomplish the will of God through your life and ministry? That's the question that all Christians have to wrestle with, especially if you're a pastor and you get paid to be a Christian, basically. Are you using your ministry? Do you see yourself as you exist for the benefit of the people that God has entrusted to your care? Or do you see those people as a means of accomplishing your will? Very critical, critical question to ask yourself. Jesus, we see the perfect man, the perfect minister, and he tells us this is what it should look like. We seek the will of God alone. Second section we'll call the message of four witnesses. That's verse 31 to the end of the chapter. And you see here really three, uh, four witnesses. Uh, the first is John the Baptist. You see this in verses uh, 33 through 35. And, and well, let me back up and give you the, the backstory for this. So when it comes to proofs for something, you, you go all the way back into the, 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 the first five books of the Bible, really Exodus through Deuteronomy, and you're going to see there a, a principle established that when it comes to things like proving something, say in a court of law, that one witness was not enough. You would need multiple. And in the Bible, it's two or three witnesses. You need two or three witnesses to establish anything. Well, what we see here is we see four witnesses, all which point to the same thing, that Jesus is the Messiah and he's the Son of God. The first one is John the Baptist, verses 33, 34, and 35. His testimony about, uh, about who Jesus is is clear. Jesus calls it the truth. Second are the miracles, verse 36. The miracles prove who I am, that I'm the Son of God. Third is the Father. You see in verses 31 and 32, and you also see in verses 37 and 38, the Father testifies. The Father is a witness brought into the courtroom. He is the Son of God. And then it's the Scriptures as well, verses 39 to 47. The Scriptures are proof. All the prophecies of Jesus throughout the Old Testament, all the ones that he fulfilled, those are the proof. He is doing what the Old Testament said the Messiah would do hundreds of years before he showed up. Even Some even thousands of years before he showed up. So John the Baptist, the greatest prophet, the miracles themselves, God the Father himself and the scriptures, all proof, not two, not three, four witnesses that Jesus is the Christ. And in this passage, that Jesus is the Son of God. So again, the question for you watching is verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. Again, this is John's goal in every single incident that he writes in this book. And I wonder if you're watching, if that is your goal for going through this book. Is it just information? Information's not gonna cut it. That is a clear message of the book of John. Information is not enough. 
There's a difference between believing that something is true and believing in Jesus. This book, I want you to believe in Jesus. I want you to take the truth that you know. I want you to stake your life and your eternity on it. I want you to come to him, trusting in him to be your savior. That's what the book of John is about, and that is my goal for this study in John chapter 5.